The armies of the ruinous powers and the immaterium are immeasurably vast, a perhaps never-ending horde of never-born were they ever assembled together. Within these forces is a wide array of different demonic entities, probably more diverse than we can ever hope to see in the Materium, but in these series of logs, we've only explored a handful. So today, I want to try and bulk out the roster of demons aligned to each of the Chaos Gods, as well as those of Chaos Undivided, so that those of you unfortunate enough to encounter the Neverborn are at least a little better warned about what's out there. This will probably end up being a little disjointed as a result, since we won't be repeating ourselves with regards to the demonic entities out there that we have addressed before, but I do hope that it's at least informative, if not exactly a survival guide. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. Just as a quick catch up, let's recap briefly what exactly demons are and how they operate on the whole. Demons are, broadly speaking, offshoots or fragments of a Chaos God, created using a portion of the God's power on the whim of the God itself. This means that the demons will reflect their God's nature and methodology. Demons of Khorne are exceptional melee fighters with a slightly unhealthy obsession with blood and skulls, whilst those of Nurgle will usually carry all manner of disease, yet still maintain a cheery outlook. Almost their entire purpose in existence is to fight in the Great Game, the endless wars between the Ruinous Powers within the Immaterium. It's a miserable existence for them, and they're exceptionally eager to get away from it and cause some mayhem of their own. Unfortunately for the denizens of real space, said getaway usually takes the form of demonic possession on the micro scale, or full scale incursions on the macro scale. When the walls between warp and reality thin, denizens of the warp will find a way to slip through the barrier via a warp rift of some kind. However, they cannot survive in real space for all that long, since their power is drawn exclusively from the warp, which is in some ways anathema to reality. This is why possessions can happen, other than a simple desire to create havoc, as a mortal shell will sustain a demon in real space for much longer, perhaps even indefinitely at least until the shell is slain. In the case of a larger or more stable warp rift, many more demons will make their way through in what is typically classified as a demonic incursion. These invasions last about as long as the warp rift remains open, and typically the only way to survive one is either to wait out the closing of the portal, or to actually close it manually. The former is a very risky game since their open time is essentially totally random, and the latter requires exceptional warriors and psychers to both fight to and then seal the rift. The demons themselves are also very aware of the random and stoppable clock that their incursion is on, and will typically do their utmost to make the most of their time in the Materium. Mayhem and violence ensue as the Legiones Demonica run amok. There are some incursions that never end, however, as the presence of the Immaterium bleeding into reality can begin to transform and warp the space nearby. Given a large enough rift and a long enough time, the entire planet or area the rift appeared on can be changed, as the Immaterium claims the world for its own and transforms it into what is known as a demon world. If you thought that a demonic incursion was a hellish nightmare, and believe me it really is, then they have nothing on the demon world, and I'll spare you the details since the warp can be known to have quite the maddening effect on mortals. In the previous logs we've given on demons, we discussed the idea of greater and lesser demons, entities of different power with different places in the hierarchy and military of each god. The lesser demons are the foot soldiers of the demonic legions, the most numerous by far, but no less dangerous to the untrained mind or even to the most seasoned warriors. Most commonly, the lesser demons of the foot soldiers for the corn are the bloodletters, those of Zinch are the pink, blue and brimstone horrors, Nurgle has the plague bearers, and Slanesh the demonettes. The most powerful of these lesser demons are known as heralds, though a lot of them have a bunch of fancy titles like bloodmasters or spoilpox scriveners or whatever else. These are lieutenants of sorts for greater demons or demon prince generals who can inspire those around them using what is known as a locus. You might have heard of some of them, Skulltaker, Epidemius, The Mask, The Blue Scribes, the list kinda goes on and on and we'll keep filling it out as we go. 
On the other hand, the greater demons are the largest and most powerful of a Chaos God's creation, mightier than the demon princes elevated from mortality to the ranks of the Neverborn. You won't typically see more than one or two knocking around save in the most vast demonic legions where several gods will often work together, but they are absolute powerhouses. A single one can lay waste to the largest of war engines or vast regiments on their own using psychic power, combat prowess or a myriad of other talents. By ascending sacred number, they are the keepers of secrets for Slanesh, the great unclean ones for Nurgle, the bloodthirsters of Khorne and Zinch's lords of change and some of them have become legendary, perhaps unsurprisingly. Scarbrand, Kairos Fateweaver, Kugath, and more which we will get to. However, between the lesser and greater demons, there are many other demonic creatures of varying power and intellect. Some are beasts of war let loose on the foe, others are mounts for lesser demons. There are even some demons of Chaos Undivided which are not aligned to any one particular god. Some demon princes do fall into this category, most of the demon Primarchs spring to mind, but there are some creatures in that roster too. So let's pick a random god and start filling out a bestiary of all things demonic. So where to start? Um, let's go with Nurgle, why not? Don't think I've done that one first before. There's actually more demonic thingies in the armies of Nurgle than most of the Chaos Gods, with quite a menagerie of creatures and a fair few famous faces too. Starting us off, we have the creature known very originally as the Beast of Nurgle. These are grossly bloated slug-like monsters and are surprisingly fast for their size, leaving slime trails in their wake as they excitedly race toward the foe. However, the beasts are not warriors in the conventional sense, nor do they actually hold any malice or comprehension of those they end up fighting against. Though most wouldn't admit it, Nurgle is not all about decay and disease. Well, it is, but not in a sombre way, as Nurgle is regarded as a jovial entity by those who serve it. The beasts are the embodiment of this. Too stupid to understand, they just see the possibility of new friends and rush to play with them at the earliest opportunity. Once they reach their new playmate, the toxic emissions and tentacles and slime will quickly kill the unfortunate victim, causing the beast to go running off to find a new one. Repeat ad infinitum until banished. Whilst most great unclean ones probably don't have much care aside from using the beast's accidental shock cavalry, there is one individual who is something of a handler for the creatures, the Grand Cultivator, a plague bearer named Horticulus Slimux. Slimux is responsible for tending and spreading the influence of the Garden of Nurgle itself. His shears and other gardening tools are surprisingly dangerous on the battlefield, whilst he is also able to conjure a part of the garden into reality using said tools and fertilisers. To aid in his gardening efforts, he rides what is known as a molluscoid, a snail-like demonic beast known as mulch that has a plough attached to its back to help tend the garden. Unlike the beasts he can be surrounded by, Slimux is like most every other plague bearer. Dower, lacking in a sense of humour, and pretty much completely antithetical to other demons of Nurgle. That said, there is a herald that can fit with the plague bearer mindset more accurately, the spoiled pox scrivener whose name I mentioned previously in a slightly mocking tone. These guys are kind of like a smaller version of Epidemius, the tallyman of Nurgle. Epidemius must log every disease in the universe, whilst the scriveners ensure that the plague bearers keep their own tallies going with a giant pile of bullying. And it works. I mentioned previously that the beasts of Nurgle are accidental shock cavalry in a Nurgle army, but if you actually want to see Nurgle cavalry, let me point you to the Plague Drones. These are powerful plague bearers mounted on the creatures known as Rotflies, former beasts of Nurgle who actually do end up becoming bitter and resentful due to the constant repetitive dying of their playmates come victims. The drones work as resilient, horrifying cavalry, but their primary role for the legions of Nurgle is that of overseer. Not sure exactly what they're overseeing, presumably they're just monitoring the battle on behalf of the Great Unclean One and reporting back due to their speed, but I'm not 100% on that one. On the other end of the Nurgle demon happiness scale, probably as jolly as the beasts of Nurgle, but certainly with that extra edge of spite and malevolent intellect, you have the tiny little Nurglings. These demons look like exceptionally miniature Great Unclean ones, perhaps no surprise given they are spawned in the entrails of the Crater Demons. 
and though they can fight in great swarms on their own, you'll most commonly see them hanging around their progenitor vying for attention. They can also become attached to other champions of Nurgle, retainers, maybe even like squires to an extent, though they aren't exactly renowned for being trustworthy. A large number of Nurglings can also form a steed of sort by carrying a throne or platform for the champion. This is known as a palanquin of Nurgle, and it's probably one of the most annoying, though probably not the most deadly, of mounts to fight. I think aside from the very rarely seen glitchlings, the frankly weird sloppity bile pipers with staves made from their predecessors, and the arboreal feculent narmors, that's pretty much the entire roster. But there is one more demonic champion I wish to mention before we leave behind the denizens of the garden. This is actually not a herald or a plague bearer, but rather a great unclean one, known as Rotigus Rainfather. This greater demon is constantly surrounded by, aptly enough, a rancid rainstorm known as Nurgle's Deluge, and much like the fertilizers of Horticular Slimux, it causes corrupted plant life, though perhaps not the Garden of Nurgle itself, to manifest beneath it. This allows Rotigus to pretty much corrupt an entire planet just by taking a leisurely stroll with the application of a few psychic powers where appropriate, and the Great Unclean One knows full well just how powerful it is, going to war without a single weapon, just a disease-spawning rod. Despite the virulent nature of Rotigus and the life it spawns, the mythos of the Rainfather is actually known by some mortals as a bringer of prosperity and life, Technically, this isn't wrong, especially if you're a Nurgle corrupted individual or one of the Plague Father's creations. Unfortunately for said mortals, who will actually worship Rotigus and ask for its patronage, the reality is the opposite of the idealized dream, since it only ends one way. Spoiler, it isn't good. Having drawn the ire of the Harlequins for corrupting Maiden Worlds, though the mask in question was able to somehow reverse the corruption, Rotigus was last seen, I believe, in the War of Beasts on Vigilus, being summoned by Nurgle devoted forces to aid in the corruption of that war ravaged linchpin. Next up, let's jump from one of the larger demonic bestiaries to one of the smaller ones, Zinch. In truth, this is particularly down to a chunk of lesser demons being larger than usual, since pink horrors split into blue horrors who split into brimstone horrors, so there's a little more than just one type of demon in that category. However, the horrors are not the only infantry warp fire caster in the lower ranks of Zinch's scintillating legions. Yes, that's their official name, I'm not just being complimentary. In fact, the horror's abilities with Warp Flame pales in comparison to these demons, known most commonly as the Flamers of Zinch. Sadly, they aren't actually made of their signature projectile, but they can produce a huge amount of it to be unleashed upon their enemies. The movements of Flamers would be comical in some eyes, but don't let that fool you. No armor is proof against their Warp Fire, and its effects can be exceptionally varied, but almost universally debilitating. But note that I said almost. This is the fire of Zinch, the fires of change, and change isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can in fact be good sometimes. Granted, most victims of a flamer assault do die horribly, but some don't, for whatever that happens to be worth. Typically, a flamer will not be on its own unless all of its compatriots have already been banished, but if you do see a lone flamer, then that is the time I advise you to seriously panic. Only the most powerful of their kind, known as the Exalted Flamers, have the intelligence to actually operate on their own, and they are also vastly more powerful than their peers. You sometimes see them leading groups of lesser demons, presumably not armies, since there's always heralds around to do that, but the most common place to see an Exalted Flamer is riding around on a steed called a Burning Chariot, unless a very tricksy herald manages to make off with it. Accompanied by a coterie of blue horrors, the Exalted Flamer will be mounted on a disc of Zinch, being pulled by a pair of Screamers to form the combined Burning Chariot, streaking through the Materium and being often mistaken for comets filled with ill omens a lot of the time. Since I just mentioned them, let's discuss the disc and the Screamers together, because there is a theory, if not confirmation, that they're one and the same, at least to an extent. Screamers are flying, malevolent demons that are ridiculously fast, often hunting in packs and prowling the warp. They're somewhat capable in the magical arts, though nowhere near any of the horrors. Instead, the screamers rely on their jaws to deal damage, and these jaws are no joke. 
Given a small amount of time, a Screamer pack will rip through just about anything, and this makes them one of the most feared predators for ships traveling through the Immaterium. A Gellerfield or equivalent can stop Screamers, but the slightest weakness or power fluctuation will let them through, and at that point the ship is basically done for. They don't make great mounts on their own, as evidenced by the fact that they pull the Burning Chariot as opposed to being ridden on directly since there's no Screamer mounted cavalry but they can become mounts under a specific set of circumstances. So, remember that disc of Zinch that I mentioned, the bit the Exalted Flamer rides on? Yeah, that's not an inert block of metal or anything like that, that's a Screamer, only modified by being bound in various ways. Their will is gone, replaced with that of whichever demon is riding on the disc, which can also be given as a mount to champions and mortals, but the insane speed is maintained to allow a great view of the battlefield or get out of trouble. As far as I'm aware, the disc doesn't particularly fight, presumably as a precaution in case it turns on and eats its bearer, but I'm sure at least one Exalted Flame or Herald bound the Screamer in such a way that allowed the Jaws to remain an asset. There is one more unique Zinch Demon that I know of, not including Demon Engines like the Silver Towers at least, but unfortunately, no one knows what it is, but that's on purpose. Some say that this demon's true form and nature is known only to Zinch itself, who hoards all knowledge and uses that knowledge as a weapon. All we know is, it's called the Changeling, and it is the ultimate trickster. Though some speculate it was once a horror since it's around the size of a lesser demon of Zinch, it doesn't really matter. The clue's in the name, it's a Changeling. It can take whatever form it wishes to sow maximum chaos. It is all but perfect as an impersonator, even taking on the appearance of legendary figures with near perfect accuracy and even being able to dupe their closest friends. For example, take the most recent incident I know of involving the Changeling, the siege of the Fenris system and the return of the Space Wolves Wolfen. The Changeling arguably orchestrated most of the events that led to the near war between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves after the return of the former 13th Great Company. First, it took the form of a Dark Angel scout, being interrogated by librarians and showing them that the Wolfen had returned and massacred its battle brothers on the planet of Nerides. Yes, you did hear that right, the Space Marine librarians could not tell they were probing into the mind of an actual demon. That's how convincing the impersonation skills of the Changeling are. And then, when Supreme Grandmaster Azrael expressed the desire for more evidence, the Changeling upped its game. Rather than a random battle brother who Azrael may not have personally known, it decided to morph into the form of Ravenwing Grandmaster Samael, telling of another Wolves massacre, this time on the World Tranquilitus. In reality, the Wolves and the Angels had worked together as part of a hunt for the Wolfen, but Azrael either didn't have records to cross-check, or decided to take his colleague at face value. This prompted the Dark Angels, spearheaded by both The Rock and Lionel Johnson's flagship The Invincible Reason, and accompanied by a host of other chapters, to join the war for the Fenris system that was already under a staggering demonic incursion. And even then the Changeling wasn't done with screwing over the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves, as it decided to take on the visage of The Rock's Vox Officer. Unfortunately, this ended up being one ruse too far, as Grey Knight's Captain Arvan Stern and somehow Ragnar Blackmane were able to expose the Changeling, prompting a chase through the rock involving various space marines trying to hunt the demon down. The Changeling was eventually defeated. It tried one last gambit by threatening to reveal the existence of the Fallen by setting the rock's prisoners free, but ultimately, it was unsuccessful. Now then, let's move on to what was probably the thinnest hero's gallery among the Legiones Demonica, the forces of Slanesh. To be truthful, Slanesh's roster has always been one of the thinner ones, though it might actually outnumber that of Zinch these days due to the recent emergence of a variety of entities. But before we get there, let's fill out the bestiary of the Legions of Excess a little, starting with undoubtedly one of the strangest looking demons, the Fiends of Slanesh. These creatures seem to take design inspiration from all sorts of species, blending it all together to create a multi-limbed amalgam that boggles the mind. But these aren't what you might expect from the use of language like this, as the fiends are still demons of Slanesh, 
They're exceptionally light and fast, able to close both with speed and a very disorienting movement pattern before tearing their foes apart. Their musk can confound and knock out any in their vicinity, leaving their victims easy prey for the fiend's maws and claws, but even their song can be dangerous in and of itself if you're able to somehow avoid them. Though they are powerful beasts of war, fiends are not strictly hunters. They're slanishy demons after all, and when in the domain of the Dark Prince, they'll often frolic and languish around, hunting for amusement amongst themselves. There is supposedly another type of war beast in the ranks of Slaanesh's demons, a flying creature known to some as a hate angel, but I've never actually run across or heard anything much about them, so I can't provide any more details, I'm afraid. Perhaps fortunately, we will never see fiend-mounted cavalry to my knowledge, but that doesn't mean that there's no Slaaneshi cavalry at all, far from it. Instead, the lesser demons known as demonettes will seek out and attempt to capture the flighty and curious creatures known simply as steeds of Slaanesh. The hunt isn't seemingly that dangerous, though the steeds are definitely vicious as any who attempt to fight them will find out, but it is a very difficult task nonetheless that technically never ends. A steed needs to be caught unawares or lured in by the demonette or a particularly strong mortal from the vast fields in the realm of Slaanesh, then bound with tethers of loyalty and chains of extravagant materials. The bond between rider and mount is then unbreakable and the pair become known as seekers so long as the rider never dismounts. If they let go, the steed will flit away back to the fields and leave their rider empty-handed and rather in trouble. There is another place where you can find steeds, however, being used by the armies of Slaanesh as something other than lightning-fast cavalry. Chariots. Some of the more powerful heralds of Slaanesh can ride to war aboard a seeker chariot, though in truth the chariot itself is basically a bunch of blades on wheels with a very small amount of standing room. Typically armed with lashes to reach the foe, the herald or other riders can still reap a great tally, but if you still want to see an even more truly powerful ridiculous example of bladed overkill, there is an alternative. The Exalted Seeker Chariot has twice as many steeds pulling it as the standard variant, as well as many, many, many more grinding blades under and behind it. This is a mount for the most unsubtle of heralds, as its job is to crash into concentrated areas and literally run enemies over, grinding them into nothing even as the herald and retainers attack in turn. And even then, this chariot isn't done with you, as its blades are able to ensnare the souls of those caught and eviscerated, dragging the spirit through for another round of hell under the wheels of the chariot. There's also a chariot that isn't strictly ridden by heralds. I believe the commander of this machine is known as an exalted Alares, but I'm unsure and I'm not going to go and cross-check by asking one. It's called a Hellflayer, and originally it was designed essentially for gardening duty, cleaning up battlefields both mortal and demonic after it was over to dispose of the bodies into nice little chunks because the defendant Slaanesh. Though used as a form of punishment for demonettes who had slightly irked the Dark Prince, it was upgraded to something very different after a pair of rebellious ones decided to drive theirs into the thick of combat against demons of Nurgle rather than wait until the fight was over. The experience for them was incredible, apparently, and Slaanesh was so won over that it decided that Hellflayer piloting was a reward instead of a punishment, and also something that was still allowed for deployment in the armies. Though the demonettes who actually did it were of course punished, because Slaanesh is capricious like that. Jumping back to heralds before we arrive at legendary figures, I want to touch quickly on a seemingly newer breed of herald that I never want to run across, the Infernal Enrapturess. Exactly how high ranking the Enrapturesses sit in terms of Slaanesh's favour I do not know. Given their unique skills and armaments I'd wager that at least some are pretty close to the Dark Prince's throne, but that capricious nature I already mentioned means I can't be sure and it probably doesn't last for long. They don't fight in melee like their peers, but instead engage in something rarely seen much outside of Demons of Zinch, ranged combat, using sonic attacks to destroy victims from afar. Scary enough, but then consider how they generate these attacks. It's not a scream, but instead the playing of a harp made from the body and bits of a previous victim. Ugh. 
These hearts are also potent tools seemingly for weakening the boundary between warp and reality as far as I can tell, as it seems easier to summon demonic reinforcements to the battlefield when one happens to be playing. And speaking of heralds with unique abilities, let's start filling out that rogues gallery I mentioned previously with a herald. Well, sort of. To be totally accurate, they were a herald known as Syl, renowned for having a deeper affection for mortals than their peers, and then being shunned by said peers as a result. However, Syl then chose to give patronage to a mortal gladiator in the realm of Slanesh known as Esk, who was able to achieve elevation to a demon prince with the aid of the herald, but was then also shunned by the other Slaneshi demons of court. This actually is less of a surprise. Demon princes are often looked down on by some or most for their mortal origins. The two decided to form a team in order to claim their revenge against their would-be peers, fighting together and using their opposite skill sets, Lithe Fighting Machine and Massive Juggernaut of Doom, to great effect. They proved so effective as a team that they made it all the way to the Palace of Pleasure and right up to the throne of Slanesh itself, where they bound their already twined fates together inseparably. Sil and Esk ceased to be, and in their place came Sil Esk, a symbiotic pair who fight more effectively now than the two ever could apart. Finally, we banged on about lesser demons for a long time now, we haven't mentioned a single greater demon since Rotigus, so let's redress that with a Keeper of Secrets known as Shalaxi Hellbane. All Keepers of Secrets are the pinnacle of Slaanesh's demonic warriors, but not all are created equal due to the whims of Slaanesh, and many will be deceivers and the like as well as martial champions. However, Hellbane was created with a singular purpose by the Dark Prince, the slaying of greater demons of the other Chaos Gods, with a particular focus on Bloodthirsters, due to the great rivalry of Slaanesh and Khorne. There are those who say that Shalaxi is THE undisputed champion in terms of mortal prowess, not just amongst the legions of Slaanesh, but across all of the Chaos Gods. Others say that Hellbane's list of defeated adversaries includes many legendary names, with one in particular that would be incredible if true, Scarbrand. If you recall our last demonic discussion log, Scarbrand was once the most powerful and favoured bloodthirster of Khorne, though arguably the former part, and definitely the latter part, has been superseded since his betrayal and the creation of Angrath. This means that if the rumours and whispers are true, Shalaxi has, at worst, defeated the second most powerful combatant amongst the demonic legions. Whether it's true or not, I can't say, but the fact it's even considered possible should tell you just what this Keeper of Secrets can do. And now we come to Khorne, patron deity of a huge amount of demon engines as discussed in a previous log, but also creator of a few different demons as well. However, when you take the engines out of the calculus, you start to realise that the Cornate roster is a tad sparse, perhaps even more than Zinch's, though I have been counting chariots for Zinch and Slanesh, so I doubt I'm using consistent logic when I do that calculation. That said, the Demons of Corn and the occasional Mortal Champion arguably have the most iconic of demonic mounts. The part living metal, part burning blood, all bad attitude, monsters known as Juggernauts. These beasts aren't exactly all that smart, but in many ways, you don't have to be when you're a hulking demon come battering ram, augmented or crafted with living metal and with all the power to match. They constantly battle amongst themselves within their pens in the domain of the blood god, but a demon or mortal feeling particularly brave or confident can attempt to break one to its own will. This rarely ends well, and the Juggernaut pens are littered with corpses of those who failed as a testament to that, but if the beast can be mounted and tamed, then it forms an incredibly effective heavy cavalry mount. It would take an incredibly powerful blood letter to even dare go near a Juggernaut, but those who do tame one are known as blood crushers alongside the mount, combining precise expert blademanship with brutal crunching charges. Some blood crushers are instead known as blood stalkers, who somewhat shirk this line-breaking impact in favour of hunting, flanking, and picking apart isolated defences. Heralds of Corn who ride on a juggernaut, and there are many of them, are known as skull masters. Those on foot typically refer to themselves as blood masters, and those on the blood thrones we've discussed elsewhere as a demon engine and chariot are known as rend masters. 
The Juggernauts, however, are not the only beasts who go to war in Cornate armies, though they are probably the largest and the only ones used as cavalry. The others are known as Flesh Hounds, and they truly are the hunters and seekers of the Blood God. Genuinely, that's pretty much their raison d'etre, hunting down the enemies of Corn on the battlefield or in the Immaterium. They're durable and as large as an Astartes, with very impressive speed and power in melee to boot. But of course, sometimes the Blood God demands the hunting down and head taking of one skilled in the arts of the warp, an expertise that Korn's armies do not have due to the God's hatred of all things sorcerous. As such, the Flesh Hounds are outfitted with an anti psychic defense mechanism known as a Collar of Corn, a brass collar that draws in the power of the Inner Materium as a means of nullifying psychic abilities. And of course, where there is a pack of hunting beasts, even demonic ones such as flesh hounds, there is almost always an alpha lurking somewhere that is strongest of all. In the case of the flesh hounds, it isn't just a case of a slightly larger or faster flesh hound being the most favoured of Korn's hunters. Oh no, Korn created a unique Cerberus-esque creature to fulfil the duty of the ultimate hunter, known as Karanak. This three-headed beast can summon other flesh hounds to join it in battle, but it isn't dispatched from the Blood God's own throne groom where it stands guard for any old reason. Instead, Korn unleashes Karanak only on those poor souls who directly insult it. A warrior who fails to obey Korn's way of war, a pacifist who will not let the blood flow, or others for some grave slight or another. Flesh hounds are hard enough to get away from when on the hunt, but Karanak is literally impossible to hide from, even if you can defeat it when it tracks you down. The reason for this is the whole three heads malarkey, as each is designed to track the prey in a different way. The first hunts through time, the second through space, meaning the entire materium cannot provide even a shred of cover. Okay, no problem, you may say. The warp doesn't play by the laws of space and time and physics, so Karanak can't find you there. Firstly, well, why would you try to hide from a demon in the warp? It's literally their home and they will outlast you in it. Secondly, you've forgot the third head, which senses the target's thoughts and uses that as a tracking mechanism. You can't turn off your own mind, so Karanak will catch you and claim your blood, skull, corpse for its master unless you can fight it off, which is no small feat in itself. We've discussed pretty much every famous Cornate champion somewhere before. Scarbrand, Skulltaker, Angrath, Doombreed... Wait, 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 no, there is one. A demon whose name I've mentioned in many a log, but whose story I've actually never told. Let's correct that. I speak, of course, of perhaps the first bloodthirster ever met by the Legiones Astartes, the Angel's Bane, Kabanda. This bloodthirster is part of the First Host, one of the eight most powerful bloodthirsters in existence alongside Angrath and formerly Scarbrand before its exile, and it has become the sworn enemy of the now-dead Primarch Sanguinius and his sons, the Blood Angels. Kabanda first entered the Materium to our knowledge during the Battle of Cygnus Prime in the early Horus Heresy, dueling Sanguinius and breaking his legs before arguably awakening the Red Thirst within the Ninth Legion that had lain dormant for so long. Some even claim that Kabanda triggered the Black Rage, though that is up for debate. Sanguinius was able to banish the Bloodthirster and escape from Cygnus, but the two fought again in the Battle of Terror at the end of the Heresy, this time, though, Kabanda stood no chance against the Angel, who used all of his legendary power to break the demon's back over his knee. But of course, demons never stay dead unless very specific conditions are met, though it would be millennia before Kabanda was encountered again. It was beaten by a Grey Knight Captain at some point in history, but it crossed paths with the former Ninth Legion in late M41 when the Grey Knights invited Commander Dante and the Blood Angels to join the purging of the demon world Kalagazar. It was later defeated just by the Sanguinor, the ultimate get out of jail card the Blood Angels have in another war, but it then appeared again during the events known as the Devastation of Baal when the Cicatrix Maledictum ripped reality in two. Armies of Khorne assailed the moon of Baal Primus, slaying the disoriented Tyranids along with the Flesh Terrors and Knights of Blood successor chapters. The latter bought time for the former to get away, with Kabanda personally slaying the Knights Chapter Master who refused to give in to his bloodthirst and serve Khorne. 
The skulls of the Tyranids were arranged to create a vast effigy in the shape of Kabanda's rune, so large as to be visible from Baal itself. The moon was destroyed after the departure of the Indomitus Crusade, though once the war was over, as if to say, you do not own us, get lost. Most recently, Kabanda has been involved not with the Blood Angels, but with what you might consider internal affairs, as the Chaos Gods duel it out over the region known as the Scourge Stars. The demon Primarch Mortarion was able, with help, to banish Kabanda once again, but it's a bloodthirster, it's a demon, it will be back. And quickly to finish, let's take a whistle stop tour of Chaos Undivided. We won't be here long, I suspect, we're just filling in a few blanks. You don't see many undivided demons in the Materium, but one of the more common, aside from demon princes, would certainly be the beasts known as Chaos Furies. We're not actually 100% sure how a fury comes to be, since it can't be made from a Chaos God's will due to being undivided. If it were made from the will of a god, then it would be aligned to that god, and if it were made from all of them, well, they wouldn't be as feeble as they are. Some believe they're made from those souls who do not embrace the patronage of Chaos, or at least not of the Chaos Gods, and instead seek to use the power of Chaos for themselves. That would mean that, should he reject demonhood and not be condemned to spawn them, technically, in theory, Warmaster Avadon will end up as a fury one day. Just think on that one. Others say that they're just small accretions of warp energy, barely enough to form a demon around an emotion, and certainly nothing on the level of the other Neverborn. Whatever their origins actually are, Furies are typically classified as barely sentient demons with a status among demon kind that is insignificant even against lesser demons. They can be enslaved by a god easily, or be captured by some mortals or demonic lords, morphing in form to reflect their new master in the case of a deity whilst it's also claimed that they are unable to enter the domains of the ruinous powers and must instead wander the hostile wastes of the Immaterium instead. However, they're still dangerous predators that, despite their weaknesses, must not be underestimated. They have the ability to fly, as well as often hunting in packs. They're vicious. Whilst Furies are the most commonly seen undivided demons aside from possibly demon princes these days, Back in the Horus Heresy, there was actually a host of different demons that entered reality whilst Erebus's Ruin Storm was open. These included heavy melee infantry, broadly classified as Brutes. These monstrosities were apparently vanguard units that towered over even the Legionis Astartes and were capable line breakers and bullet magnets. Larger demonic leaders known as Shrikes also manifested from the Ruin Storm. As the name might suggest, these demons were capable of flight due to wings of varying design, and whilst I don't know their size relative to greater demons or demon princes, I'm still glad that I've never run across one. However, there were even larger demons apparently from the Ruin Storm, though they appeared not to be the commanders in general. They were known as behemoths, titan scale beasts that almost act more like engines of war as opposed to anything else. Insanely tough and armed with a host of horde clearing appendages and weapons, I suspect that even the largest of Tyranid bioentities would be given a run for its chitin against them. Actually, that makes me think. I wonder if there will be, or have been before, an emergence of similar demons with the appearance of the Cicatrix Maledictum, which, whilst less of an artificial warp storm, is still a massive warp storm across a large portion of the galaxy that cut it open. I haven't seen reports that suggest it, but at the same time, it also wouldn't surprise me. Maybe something to keep an eye on in the logs. And there we have it, an almost complete demonic roster when combined with our other logs on demons, demon princes, demon engines, and all of that good stuff. Whilst the Neverborn are of course incredibly diverse, this should hopefully give those of you unfortunate enough to face them a better idea of what you're up against. Will it help you survive them? Probably not, I'm a storyteller, not a survival guide writer, but at least you'll understand and maybe you'll get lucky, who knows. Anyway, with that done, it's time for us to move on. In fact, I had an idea. You may remember that I gave something of a geography lesson during a previous log when we looked at the layout of the galaxy. Well, whilst I don't make a habit of looking into individual worlds or systems in and of themselves, I think I can make an exception in this case. 
Join me next time as we explore perhaps the most famous system in the entire galaxy, certainly the most important from an Imperial standpoint. For now though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.